Juan, Brother Juan's not here. I was going to give him a little props uh, last week. Uh, he gave a message on uh, spiritual maturity, right? Do you all remember the message about uh, having milk and then having solid food, which represents milk is like... When we first become Christians, you know, we, we kind of start kind of like a baby. You know, you take a little bit of milk. And then once you start growing up, you start doing solid food, right? Well, I believe that little by little, we as a church, as a congregation, oh, I was just talking about you, one, <laughs> that we are growing. And I do think that it's, how, how many want more solid food, right? I mean, don't get me wrong. Milk's good. But how many want a little bit more of that solid, that solid food to, to kind of get a little bit more muscles and stuff like that? Amen. All right, okay, so uh, let us uh, receive manna from heaven. Actually, manna from heaven, everyone knows what manna is, right? Uh, quick story, I remember um, when I was younger, not too long ago, but uh, I remember we went to this church, and it was like a corfertenidad. What is that in English? Conference, I guess? Okay. And uh, it was uh, in Houston, and I remember a lot of different churches went. And uh, it was an awesome service. They had a... The praise and worship and things like that and it lasted i mean it started and it lasted for over two hours just the praise and worship it's one of those services like old school you know and uh uh so i remember it went on and then after that they had the offering and the testimonies and this and that so probably i was saying it was getting close to 11 o'clock and then i remember the pastor coming up and he took the pulpit and uh you know i was with a couple of my buddies and i was like man i mean it's a good service but i'm ready to you know it's we're going to go to Denny's or something after that, you know, and, uh, uh, and, and I just remember that he got up there and he was like, praise God, it was a beautiful service. But in Spanish, he was like, ahora vamos a recibir maná de cielo, which in, it, in, in English, he was like, now let us receive manna from heaven. And I was like, oh, snap, he's going to preach, you know, like after like it's already 11 o'clock and anyways uh, anyways I thought that was funny it's like so I'm telling you today let us receive manna from heaven but I won't keep you all there here that long amen okay we'll eventually get back to some of those old school services um, let us turn to uh, our Bibles to the book of first John first John chapter 3 verse 4 and this is an important verse that I, I would like us to, you know, if you have a highlighter, you know, mark it or your pen or on your phone, you know, uh, I, I do think that this is a verse that sometimes uh, we lose track of. This is a, some, a question I asked a couple weeks ago. And um, uh, let us read. Everyone say amen. All right. It says, whosoever committed sin transgresses also the law for sin is transgression. Of the law everyone say with me uh, uh from the beginning whoever committed sin transgressive also the law together for sin everyone for sin is transgression of the law again one more time everybody for sin is so what is sin transgression of the law good a lot of times when they ever anyone ever uh ask you a question hey what is sin? You know, we have all these different definitions, and they're all right. But when you really look into the word, sin is transgression of the law. Okay? Praise God. So we are sheep. We are to hear his voice, obey his law. We call it law today. Back then, they would call it his commandments, the Torah. Everyone know what the Torah is? Right, the Torah, the, the books of the Bible, or the, the first books of the Bible, uh, the law. We, we call it the law, uh, commandments. Uh, they call it the Torah. Just as Yahshua, everyone know the name of Yahshua, right? Sometimes I've been looking into it a little by little. I've been really enjoying using and learning a lot of the Hebrew words and Jewish words because it kind of, it makes me feel like, man, that's that's kind of how they were kind of close to like what they were talking and how they were saying. I know uh, name is not important. He is the name above all names, Jesus, the Christ, Yahshua, Yahweh. But so I might be using a couple of these words just so we can start getting familiar with it. Amen. So yeah, um, Yahshua did. Will any of us be perfect? Question. Will any of us be perfect when it comes to following the law? No, of course not. Have any of us broke the law or, or his commandments before? Yep. We've all done it. Yes. Nevertheless, this does not give us an excuse to keep on sinning. What is sin? Transgression of the law. 
This does not give us an excuse to keep breaking his law, his commandments, or his Torah, right? Okay, so I'm going to read a little bit, and basically, it's basically a summary of where we are at today. The title that I, I have for the message today is Passover. Remember two, uh, a couple weeks ago, two weeks ago, we went over the Passover, right? We barely kind of started because there's so much information on the Passover, uh, which is one of the feasts of our, of our Lord and Savior, right? God's appointed times, okay? So Passover part two is what I named it, okay? So we're going to kind of go over a summary first of how we got to this point. Who are we? Who are we? What is our identity in the Lord, okay? So, bear with me. I'm going to read. And um, just to kind of get an idea. I know most of this, you are going to be understanding, but it's good to hear every once in a while. So, Elohim, God, another word, which represents God, creator, created everything in the world through his son, Messiah, the Messiah, the word, Yeshua, Jesus, including us, the heavens, the earth, the sea, and all that is contained within the fall from perfection started with who? Adam and Eve, who broke the one commandment that they were given. Mankind fell from the Garden of Eden and were placed into the world. Evil multiplied through the generations until the first end of the world came through the great flood, right? Noah, his wife, three sons, and their wives were saved by listening to Elohim, God our father and building the ark as they were instructed after the flood subsided the whole earth repopulated through the three sons of Noah right <clears throat> once again men loved evil rather than good and wickedness increased on the earth so here we are again you know God destroyed the world but we're back to our old habits right however Abraham which at the beginning his name was Abram God changed to Abraham, was selected amongst them all, be taken to Elohim, God, as his own possession, he and his descendants forever. Okay, so basically, this lineage became known as Israel through his grandson Jacob, okay? So follow me so far. Remember, uh, uh, Abraham had Isaac, and then Isaac had Esau and Jacob, and then Jacob's name was changed to Israel, okay? That's where we come with Israel today. Okay, Jacob and his 12 sons, we remember the story, right? The 12 sons uh, who became the 12 tribes of Israel, due to famine, they were led into Egypt and built it up to become the world empire. And eventually they also became enslaved in it. So we know where are they to Egypt, right? The Hebrews uh, started there when Joseph went in, you know, was a second to Pharaoh. And then now, after a while, the Egyptians oppressed uh, the, the people of Israel, okay? Yet, Yahshua, God, in his mercy, raised up Moses, the deliverer, to deliver his people, bring them out of slavery with a mighty hand with plagues and wonders and miracles as they increased. After being led out of Egypt, the nation of Israel was taken to Mount Sinai, where they entered into a covenant with the Creator, likened to a marriage. Now, this is very important. Because right here in the history of, 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 of humanity, this is the point. God had chosen first with Abraham. He made, he made a, a covenant with Abraham, right? He said, I'm separating you from the rest of the world. Because before that time, there was no Hebrews. There was no Gentiles. Everybody was together. But right there, he said, I'm choosing you, Abraham, and I'm going to select you as my people, right? That's when he separated. He made a covenant. Then when we get to Mount Sinai and Moses, that's when God gave them the law, the Torah, which is, that it, 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 it's so beautiful, but it's basically God gave us, it pretty much asked us to marry him. We, be, we take him, we become the bride, and the covenant that God made with us is pretty much like vows, wedding vows. He's like, you know, uh, these are the laws, these are my vows, and we both accept, right? No, how many are married here? Okay. Well, everyone still understands. Okay. Well, so we got the, the, the idea that there, these were, this was basically a wedding, right, at Mount Sinai. So let me, let me get back to it. Okay. They were given the promise uh, 
They were given promises and rules to follow through the Torah, which is the law, known as his instructions. After 40 years of wandering the desert, the next generation made it into the promised land as their parents were disobedient and were not allowed to enter because of their disobedience in the Torah, which is the law, right? Israel eventually settles into the promised land, but refused to keep the Torah, refused to keep the laws. For many years, they were plagued by nearby nations as punishment between the lessons learned through the hardships they had uh, encountered and judges they were raised up to deliver them they were led back to Yahweh and his Torah at a time but after some time they yet fell again into rebellion as soon as they became comfortable it kind of sounds familiar you know sometimes as a church today we kind of get a little comfortable and then that's when laziness comes in and then that's when we stop praying might we might stop you know fasting if we ever started fasting <laughs> and that's when we start certain things and that's when um, a disobedience comes in okay so this is the people of Israel right the bride the bridegroom uh, the bride of Yeshua so after um, uh, let's see they became into rebellion and became comfortable okay a few generations later David was raised up a true man after Yahweh's heart God's heart who exemplified how to love him and his people with all his heart reversing back to the Torah to the law of, of Yahweh of God the kingdom thrived during his reign and he was promised that one of his descendants would rule on the throne forever a foreshadow and prophecy of our great Messiah Yahshua Yeshua Jesus right so God told David from my from your line I'm going to send the Messiah. I'm going to send the Savior. Hallelujah. Okay. So, the king, uh, okay, so David died and Solomon, his son, took over. But after, but after him, the nation of Israel was split into two kingdoms. Remember, the northern ten tribes, northern ten tribes, um, which was Israel, uh, or Ephraim. There's two things that we can learn. The northern uh, ten tribes were called Israel or Ephraim. And the southern kingdom was Judah, which was where uh, Jerusalem was and which is called the Jews today. Okay? So two different kingdoms, right? Uh, some of David's descendants who became kings were good and ruled with the Torah and the law. But some, however, were evil. We, we've we gone over that. They had, <laughs> they had a lot of evil kings, right? were evil and rebelled against Elohim God and his Torah the law. The northern house was overtaken and sent into captivity. The prophet Jeremiah records that they were divorced. Now that's a really, really big part of our history of humanity. At this point, Israel was now considered divorced. We know how divorce is. Why? Why? See, if you look at the story, Remember, God selected us. He selected his people, right? Then he on Mount Sinai with Moses, we exchange wedding vows, you know? Do you take this? Yes, I do, you know? And then we had wedding. And, and what was those wedding vows called? They were called his, his Torah, his law, right? But after over and over and over again, what did his people do? What, what did Israel do? They kept cheating on him kept going to false gods and pagan and traditions and stuff like that we would come back we'd say i'm sorry but then we do it again then we come back and say i'm sorry then we would do it again and we know that after a while sometimes we have to say enough is enough and god at this point was like okay you know what that's it i'm tired of you cheating on me i'm giving you a bill of divorce so boom you know that that's huge okay the southern kingdom fell into massive apostasy which I do feel that in these last days, the church is in this point, okay? Just as the northern kingdom had and were taken over into Babylon, they were held for 70 years until they were allowed to return. The temple and the city were rebuilt, yet they were never really able to shake that pollute, their polluted ways and rebellion to his law, to his Torah, to the wedding vows. Then came our Messiah, Yahshua, the promised one, the chosen one, our very own creator, the word made flesh and walked the earth, healing, teaching, and prophesying of greater things to come. 
the gospel of the kingdom. He walked in and taught faithfully with the law, with the Torah, with the commandments of Elohim, God, and showed us how to do it. He demonstrated the difference between and his dislike for man-made laws that were added to his father's Torah and law, and in some cases, even elevated above. So this is very important, because I know a lot of times we, as the modern church Christian, we kind of look at the Old Testament. You know, there's some churches that they don't, they don't even look at the Old Testament. They don't even look at the law or the commandments, because they're like, no, no, that's not for us. That's for the Jews, you know? And the problem is that, remember, the Pharisees and Sadducees, they were taking a lot of those and they were making their own rules and regulations. Kind of like we do today, right? A lot of churches, we have our own rules and regulations and that's okay. But when you start putting that above God's law and start making that the focus, that's when Jesus, Yeshua was like, you know, you hypocrites. You know, you're coming in thinking that you're all mighty and this and that. And yet you were missing the basic principles. Okay. So we got, we got this going on. Um, Let's see. Uh, ultimately, we know he was rejected by the Jews and eventually crucified the most brutal of executions known to man. He rose again to eternal life and was revealed to his apostles and others for many days, continuing to reveal the scripture of truth. Then on Pentecost, one of the seven feasts that we're going to go over, one of the days of Yahweh, um, the apostles were given the Holy Spirit. So this was another huge part of our history. God gave us the helper, the, the one that was going to help us get through uh, this world. Okay, so God gave us the Holy Spirit and the power to spread the good news of faith, forgiveness, baptism, repentance, and a newness of, a newness of life through Messiah Yeshua Jesus. Amen. And that's where, that's where the story ends. Okay, so we, we kind of seen from the beginning, from Adam and Eve, all the way to the resurrection of Messiah and, and, and him being taken into heaven. It's a beautiful story. And like I said a couple of weeks ago, the whole story is a marriage, and it's about God make, redeeming his unfaithful bride, right? Okay. So we know the divorce is bad. Now, one of the things that I've learned that is very important, man, we're running out of time because there's so much, and I know, but in, in, in the law and the commandments, you know, divorce is obviously frowned upon, but when in, 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 in Israel, when a wife or a husband would divorce his wife, she would go off, maybe she'd get married with somebody else, the, the original husband can no longer take her back. It's against the law. It's in God's law, okay? He can no longer take her back. The only way unless that she can be free of this is if for the man to die. Once he dies, then, he, then she's free again, you know? But I, I almost feel like when God, you know, how many believe that God breaks his own commandments? God does not break his commandments. He does not. So when God divorced Israel and then he sent his son to die for them or, or to, 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 to save them I'm pretty sure sometimes I even think of like the angels were like scratching their head and saying wait whoa 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 we know God doesn't break his commandments what are you doing how you how are you gonna why are you it's over you divorced them right they all they went off with pagan gods and, and stuff like that you can't take them back but if you want to call it, God is perfect. He's all knowledgeable. Almost like a loophole. What did he have to do to take his unfaithful bride back? He had to die. It's basically like a loophole, right? We can't do that, right? We can't come back to life. But Jesus, he left his power, his glory, everything. He became immortal. He came to earth and he took that suffering and he died on that cross and shed his blood so we could be free again and he could accept us back in. Hallelujah. Amen. And why don't we give a hand clap for that? That is, if you want to say, the beginning of this new story. God fulfilled the covenant. Now, why the Passover? Why the feast? Why the law? 
See, one of the things that I've been understanding and learning the more and more is that a lot of times, and you see through the Bible, when the people of Israel, when they started getting away from his commandments, that's when things started going bad. Today, the church goes through the same thing. We start off strong. We start off with the foundation. But then little by little, we get comfortable. We start implementing new things, maybe things from the world, some pagan traditions, you know. We start letting things into the house of God. Then after a generation or two, our kids grow up. They think it's normal. Now, all of a sudden, I mean, I've seen some uh, different churches and ministries and pastors and stuff like that. And man, you, you'd be surprised. Maybe not because y'all you'll probably watch stuff more than even me online and stuff but you've seen some churches and it is basically heresy of what is happening to the church today i mean i've seen things on their altar where it was like dude is this even a christian church and it is it's basically the same thing we're following into the same pattern bringing in pagan gods there uh, uh, you know ceremonies that are, are rituals like, like resurrection sunday all of a sudden we're you know wake up one day and we're you know, celebrating uh, Resurrection Sunday with a, a big old Easter bunny on, on stage. And then we go home and eat our Easter ham and stuff like that or whatever. And, you know, what happened? You know, celebrating Halloween and these things. We're bringing in the stuff from Egypt. We're bringing things back from Babylon. And it's hard to let those things go. So why the Passover? Why the feast? Because I do believe that these are God's appointed times. They're there for a reason. Now, a couple of points I want to go over before we run out of time. If you look at, for example, the, fe the Feast of Passover, which we're kind of go over, in, and it's going to be the Feast of Passover, which they kind of, some of them overlapped. It's the Feast of Passover. Oh, uh, actually, real quick. Hey, bro, you want to pass these out? And it's kind of just to follow along a little bit. And I'll let brother uh, pass out these sheets. And on the back, you'll even see like a calendar. Uh, it's it's actually a calendar from last year of when they celebrated Passover. So how many feel like we are ready to, to get into that, to, to go back to the basics, to go back to our roots, to go back to what Yeshua and the disciples were doing at the same time? You know, they were practicing these things. Why is it that today... We leave all that because you know why? Because we think that we are so elevated that we have perfected the art of preaching and music and church and stuff like that. Yet we are getting so far away from what Yeshua, God, Jesus wants us to do. So I'm going to show you just with Passover, Unleavened Bread, and you'll see a list. There's seven feasts. And uh, if y'all see those that you have them, there's seven feasts. We're only really going over the, four, the first four and really touching on mainly Passover. Passover is the big part. But it's Passover, overlaps with unleavened bread, overlaps with first fruits, and then 50 days later, it's uh, the Feast of Pentecost, okay? These are the uh, the spring feast. So you, let's look at how, how much it parallels our history as far as uh, the Bible is. Number one, people of Israel were slaves in Egypt. We all know that, right? Today, we are slaves to sin and the world. So, similar. This is Passover, okay? Number two, people of Israel did suffer the first ten plagues. A lot of times we don't know that, but, you know, some of the, the, some of the plagues did kind of hurt the people of Israel when they're in Egypt. We as believers will suffer maybe some of the pains. They, a lot of times in the Bible, they call it the birth pains, right? We're going to have witness and kind of feel a little bit of that tribulation in the last days. Number three, parallels, parallels of the Passover, okay? The people of Israel were protected in Goshen for the remainder of the plague. So God took them away. He kept them safe. So all the other plagues that were hitting Egypt weren't harming the Israel people. I believe that Yahshua, Jesus, will provide us refuge and protection in the last days. Hallelujah. Amen. Number four, the people of Israel sacrificed a lamb without blemish and blood is placed upon each doorpost to protect them from the destroyer, the angel of death. Today, uh, Yeshua, the perfect lamb without spot or blemish, was also crucified and his blood was shed upon the cross for our transgressions, saving us from that same destroyer, from Satan. Okay? Number five, 
the people of Israel set on a three-day journey into the uh, wilderness to Sukkot. Remember, the people of Israel, Pharaoh, uh, let them go. They take off for three days into the into the wilderness. What happened also three days? That was very important. Yeshua is buried for three days. Okay? Parallels. The, number seven, the people of Israel traveled 50 days to Mount Sinai to receive the covenant from Yahweh where the God's pours out his divine power. Well, what else happened? After Yeshua, Yeshua performs miracles and wonders after he resurrects and goes to heaven, 50 days later, that is when Yahweh, our Lord and Savior, pours out his Holy Spirit upon his disciples. So you kind of see, you know, everything is following basically the exact same thing. I, I always said, uh, a lot of people say the end days is like the, end, uh, the times of Noah. And I do believe that. But really, if you really want to see a parallel, study the book, the, uh, the Torah. Study what the Egyptians went through. Through Passover, you're going to see exactly what's going on. Number eight, the people, of, um, the people of Israel were in the wilderness for 40 years under Yahweh's protection, receiving food, manna from heaven, water, but still are complaining and were still implementing false gods. Remember, they were in the wilderness and God had a protection over them. Remember, it, it, for 40 years, their, their, their sandals weren't going bad. Their, 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 their clothes, they didn't, nothing happened to them. They were almost like God was protecting them from the elements of the environment. And they were still complaining. They were still, oh, why couldn't we go back to Egypt where, you know, we had it and this and that. Well, what about us today? We as Christians today are under his protection, yet we still fall short, still complaining still implementing pagan rituals and traditions. A lot of times we look at them back then, we're like, man, dude, they messed up so much. Man. But actually, sometimes we might have to look at ourselves. We might be in the same, same uh, situation. In order for us to know where to go, we have to look where we came. Amen? Uh, Remember, if we don't learn from history, we're doomed to repeat it, right? Okay. Nine, the only two from the first generation of the people of Israel when they were in the wilderness entered the promised land. That was Joshua and Caleb. Now, the promised land represents a heaven, and only a few will be selected to enter into heaven, into that promised land. How many want to be Joshua and Caleb here? Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. See, all these things during the Passover, during these feasts, during, uh, during the history, these are all things that represent us today. It is a, a, a parallel, so striking. Now, um, so I do believe that we need to wake up. I do believe that there is a great awakening happening in the church because we can see today that there has been such an apostasy to the church, a big falling away where we look, and, and sometimes I, I don't even recognize it, you know, with preachers, with their false doctrines and, and, and things that are going on unto the altar, we have to, we have to be kind of scared and say, what do, we got to wake up. And I believe that God is calling us to go back to the basis, to go back to, to his commandments, to tour, to the law, and, and understand that Jesus, Yeshua, is our Lord and Savior. But we can't just basically, remember, what is sin? Transgression? of the law. We can't just say, I accept Jesus as my Lord and Savior, and pretty much after that, we just do whatever we want. That's how we live today. We still go back to Egypt. We still go back to Babylon. We still are practicing those same things. We have, we can't be like what the people of Israel were doing. So, the the feast, and if you look on your paper, I'm going to go over a couple points. We've got a couple more minutes. How many, how many would be willing to actually kind of start learning and start to get involved in something like this as a church. You know, I talked to the pastor and uh, he's always been really big on these, on the feast, on God's anointed times. And I do think that it's kind of a, how many like challenges? Like, like if I said, like, because some of these things in the feast, they're, they're actually really fun, but you know, you have to do some fasting, you have to do certain things and whatever. And I do think that these are very, things very important. Maybe we don't have time with the whole congregation, maybe even as an English service, we can kind of get prepared to do these things. Like, so when Resurrection Sunday comes, 
we can start implementing these things. So like, for example, number one, and I think it's on your paper, I kind of put, now you're going to see a lot of different things. There's things called the Seder feast and there are things uh, that the Jewish uh, practice, but we're going to just take the basics. We're going to take what Jesus and his disciples did. Remember, they were still celebrating Passover. Okay. So first of all, uh, they roast a lamb, you know, so we go out and we make a barbecue. Know when it's time. And if you see, it says on the 14th day of the first month, they would uh, celebrate Passover. Now, the first month to them, it's not January, so we didn't miss it because January, uh, according to our calendar, the Gregorian calendar, uh, they go by the, the lunar calendar. So it's going to be somewhere like last year was in April, for example. Okay. That's when Passover started on the 14th day. Okay. And, uh, and we'll get a little bit more detail on this. But basically, just, just to run through, because we have a little bit of time left. They would go, they would barbecue a lamb, right? We can all do a barbecue, right? And we eat the lamb, you know? Uh, and one of the things that's very important, after we eat the lamb, everything has to be consumed before the next day. So we start the evening at sunset, we start Passover. Okay, let's say we all agreed to do it together, right? And then we, at the evening, we start Passover. So we basically eat lamb, we eat uh, unleavened bread, which is uh, matzah, what they call it. And we also eat bitter herbs and wine, but not wine, grape juice. Okay, and, uh, and then before the, the, uh, the day starts, the next day, whatever's left, like bones and stuff like that, we have to burn them. So we go out and we have a little bonfire or whatever. Why? Why did they get rid of it? Remember when Jesus resurrected and they went into the tomb, what did they find? Nothing. Because it was gone. So the lamb represents that. We, it has to be completely gone. Okay? Amen. One of the things that we, this might be a hard one, I don't know, but we have to remove all un, uh, un, unleavened bread for seven days. So basically, this is going to be like your cakes and your cookies and, and bread and stuff like that. Yeah, no, it's tough. So, and, and you can't just store it in your house and say, okay, I'm not going to eat it for seven days. No, it actually, you have to get rid of it. So what I would recommend is eat it all before it starts, right? <laughs> so you get rid of it for seven days, right? So we're going to go seven days and we have to eat unleavened bread, which basically we can learn recipes and see how we can do that. But it's basically like a tortilla. We know how to eat tortillas. <laughs> so we have to eat tortillas every day, right? That means no pork, no shrimp, uh, no pinguinos and stuff like that. Okay? During these seven days, we have to feast on unleavened bread because this is the feast. It goes into unleavened bread and first fruits. First fruits represents when Jesus resurrects. He's the first fruits. Amen? This is all on that seven days, okay? Um, on the seventh day, uh, we'll get to get... Uh, so on the seventh day... After, so we start, let's say it starts on a Thursday. On that following Thursday, this is when Passover ends. You get together. Let's say we got together as a, a church or we got to, or you get together with your family and you have a celebration, right? And uh, this will end the week of Passover. And then 50 days from there, 50 days from there is the Feast of Pentecost, which would be another festival, right? So how many believe that we could do something like that? Is it, is it something like, oh, I don't know, man. I like my pinguinos, you know. I do, I, I do believe that, that if we practice these things, if we practice Jewish customs and, and stuff, that things that the disciples and Jesus, Yahshua, were doing, I think that it can bring us closer together to his law, to his commandments. Instead of implementing the crazy pagan things of the world, you know, sometimes we emphasize so much, so much on these things, and it's leading us away from that. It's leading us away from him. You know, God divorced us once because of those things. The last thing we need to do is to keep doing those same things. What we should do is what the people of Israel did. When they were, knew that they were all messed up, what did they do? They went back to his roots, and that is when God blessed them. Jesus made the ultimate sacrifice for us. Amen. Um, let me finish. Uh, yeah, because we're out of time. And we're going to continue this. But everyone, raise your hand if, if you would be ready to, to do something like this. Ooh. Everybody, everybody, how many would be uh, willing to do something like uh, celebrate, start learning the Feast of Passover? Maybe we could get the whole church involved, have a barbecue outside and a fogata or a bonfire and do these things. I do think that there would be a blessing. Let us finish with Matthew 19, 
17. And we're going to conclude right here. Matthew 19 through 17. And we will continue this because I, there is a lot of information. And it says, Yahshua, Jesus, asked him, asked him, why ask me about what is good? There is only one who is good. If you want to get into that life, you must keep the commandments. Read that last line with you. If you want to get into that life, you must keep the commandments. Hallelujah. Let us stand. Let us pray. Father, we thank you so much. Yahshua, we thank you for the, the ultimate sacrifice that you gave us the opportunity to be with you. You gave your life and you shed your blood on that cross. You put your seal upon our hearts. And all that you ask is that we keep our wedding vows, that we keep your commandments, that we don't go off looking into other pagan traditions and, 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 and gods, but we keep you elevated always. We ask for your guidance, guidance for your Holy Spirit to, to give us the knowledge and wisdom to be able to practice, Father God, your law, your Torah, your commandments, always under grace. We know that nothing can happen through unless we are going through you, Yeshua, Jesus Christ. We love you. We worship you. And I ask for uh, an anointing and a knowledge and an awakening upon this congregation. In Jesus' name, we love you. We worship you. And we give you all the praise. And in Jesus' name, and we say amen. God bless y'all. And uh, maybe look into it. Amen.